Good morning. Good morning. We're back in the book of Romans this morning. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. So if you want to turn there with me. Well, before we get started this morning, um, I'm sure that a lot of us have been watching the news and a lot of us have been tuned into what's happening in, in Israel um, and Palestine and that area. Um, and uh, there's a lot that can be said about it, right? And I think it's only appropriate for us as the church to, to think on these things and to consider what's, what's happening there and to pray, really. Um, and so we prayed last week, but you know, as, as we've gathered more information, as we know more things, um, as the Lord has no doubt spoken to us throughout the week about this situation, we will pray again, and we're going to continue to pray for what's happening in that area. And so uh, this week, you know, uh, it got me thinking, like, how can we pray? How can we pray for Israel? How can we pray for Palestine? How can we pray for that area and, and that situation? And so... Um, Thanks to technology and social media, pastors from churches in that area have actually sent out prayer requests um, in regards to what they need. And so I have some of them here with me. And if you want to write them down, um, that would be great. Some, something that you can look back to during the week and put in your, in your prayer list. And um, one of them is this. Um, Obviously, the concern is for uh, Hamas um, and uh, the, the violence and terrorism that they have uh, um, acted upon to the people of Israel. Um, for additional concerns about um, some of the some of the the villages in in Israel and in Palestine that um, are specific targets for Hamas. Um, and this one is, 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 uh, is, an, is, is profound. Uh, pastors in Israel are praying for Arabs and members of Hamas to come to the Lord. To come to the Lord. For them to, to be changed and transformed by the gospel. For them to become believers. I know we talked about loving our enemies a couple weeks ago, right? And it's kind of weird to think about that in a... In a, in a Western American perspective of like, okay, I love the guy that, that cut me off in traffic, right? You know, sure, yeah, my, my boss who's really, you know, overbearing, I'll, I'll pray for him, sure, sounds good. But what struck me about this prayer request is that these people are quite literally being hunted down and, and kidnapped and tortured and killed by these people, and they're praying for their, for their salvation. Uh, I, I can't really, there's nothing else left to say, right? For Arabs and for, for, for Muslims to come to Christ, that many would turn to God and realize that Jesus is Messiah, and not just, you know, for, for the people, for the Muslims, but also for the Jews, for them to come to Christ. Um, for peace in Jerusalem, kindly pray and pray for the situation to be resolved quickly, for the men and women that have been taken captive to be released, for the many wounded to recover, and for the families of the deceased. Many of our young men, this is a pastor speaking, many of our young men and women have been called up, also reserves, um, and some are in the heart of the battles. Please join us as we pray for their safety and that they may be an encouragement and light in times of fear and pain. So we can write that down and, and, and have that in, in your back pocket, something that you can pray for throughout the week. But we're going to pray right now, and we're going to lift up that situation to the Lord. Father God, we, we come before you, Lord, here in this place. God, we we come with heavy hearts, Lord, with burdened hearts, um, 
hearts that are yearning for, for you to bring peace to that land once more. And Lord, as your word says in Psalms, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord, we pray for the peace in Jerusalem. We pray for the peace in that area. Um, we pray for peace um, in Israel. We pray for peace in Palestine. We pray for those who are getting caught in the crossfire, innocent lives, Lord, who, 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 are, who are being affected by this. We ask for your peace and your mercy to just overflow right now, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that your church there in Israel, your church, your body, would be activated, Lord, and that they would be the hands and feet of Jesus during this time of trouble, during times of sorrow, during times of difficulty, during painful, unbearable times. Lord, bring about peace, Lord. We ask for your justice, Lord, to, to, to come. Lord, for, for your goodness to, to overcome evil. And Lord, we are so looking forward, God, to that one day when we know there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, when we are with you. Lord, remind us that um, we have a very real enemy, and it's not flesh and blood, but it's powers and principalities. And so we pray against that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would just bless our time now together as we open up your word as we soak in as much as we can with what you want us to, to understand and to learn this morning. Be glorified and be magnified, God. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to have a Bible study now. <laughs> Romans 13, verses 8 through 14. Continuing our study, Romans 13, 8 through 14. The title of today's message is Our Christian Call. Our Christian Call. Last week, um, Pastor Andy uh, beautifully uh, exposited the beginning of Romans 13 to us in regards to submitting to government authorities. And uh, this, uh, these verses, this passage, kind of rolls into that, especially the first couple of, of verses um, and so we're going to get right into it, um, right there in verse 8. Let's read together. Verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Owe no one anything. Is, is the Bible giving financial advice here in this? Maybe, yeah, possibly. A number of believers use this verse to help them steward their finances. And there's a lot that can be said about that. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that we can't borrow money or be involved in legal financial transactions. But it does talk about not charging high interest rates in Exodus 22, out of God's compassion towards his people. It talks about not taking advantage of generosity from your brother or sister financially and being deceitful by not paying debts. Now, this isn't really something that we should overcomplicate because it's pretty clear that the issue really in, in, this, in this verse is our hearts, right? And isn't, isn't it always? You know, having a, a credit card is not necessarily sinful, as I'm sure most of us have a credit card here, but part of our Christian witness and even part of our submission to authority as discussed last week is to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Not just so you don't accrue unnecessary debt, although that's a really good thing to do, right? To not have any debt, you know, shout out Dave Ramsey. But to represent Christ well to a world that's watching, right? Again, it's a matter of integrity. It's a matter of character. It's a matter of witness when it comes to these things. And so Paul says, oh, no one anything except to love each other. So Paul kind of uses clever language here to get his point across. You know, don't owe, one, don't owe anyone anything. Be a person of integrity and pay your debts. But if you were to owe anyone anything, let it be love. Let it be love. And this word love here, I'm sure most of you guys know about this. You know, if you're Bible students, you're in the Word, is the word agape. This is the sacrificial, 
selfless, does not ask for anything in return kind of love, the same kind of love that Jesus preached and embodied in his ministry. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, this word another is the word neighbor in other translations, or one another, again, in, in, in other translations. And this implies relational dynamics, right? Love one another. There's something about relationship there. And, and speaking from context, Paul is writing to the Roman church, right? We know this because we've been in Romans for a long time, which means his charge is to love one another as believers. So this charge, this call is for you and me, for the church, for each other, right? We're, we're called to love our enemies, again, a couple chapters back. But this call, this specific call is towards brother and sister in Christ. Love one another. And it's, it's almost a no-brainer, right? Of course, like, we go to church, you know, we're, we're, of course we love each other. You know, we're all brothers and sisters, we're all children of God, right? Sure. Sure thing, Paul. But that's not always the case, right? If we're being honest with ourselves, that's not always the case. Uh, there's a reason Paul is making this a point in his letter to the Roman church. And there's a reason the scriptures are speaking to us about this today. That maybe, just maybe, there is a lack of love towards brothers and sisters in, in the body. And I, I would love to, to stand here and say that Christians love each other perfectly. Right, in the same agape way that Jesus does. But I can't. Right? If we're honest with ourselves, we can't either. Are we saved? Yes. Are we new creations in Christ? Yes. That's what the Bible says. Are we indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Check, check, check. Awesome. But do we also live in fleshly bodies? Yes. Do we still have the ability to sin against our brother or our sister? Yes. So you're saying we're imperfect? Yes. <laughs> but the thing is, our imperfection does not diminish our call. The call still stands. The call is to love and to keep on trying to love. Failing, as we will, repenting, then trying to love again. The call is to love. The call stands no matter what. John 13, verses 34 through 35 says this, and this is Jesus speaking. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Isn't that the mark of a, of, a, of a believer, of a Christian? If you are my disciples, you will love one another. Uh, put yourselves in the shoes of someone who's unchurched, right? Never, maybe never foot, set foot in the church before, doesn't have any type of history of faith or religion or anything like that, and they see what Christianity is and they see what the church is like. Would that be something that they want to be a part of? Would that be something that they would say, wow, I want to, I want to get into that. I see, I see their love. I see their affection. I see, I see the way they prefer each other, and I want to be part of that. Do we have that here in this church? Verse 9, let's move on. Paul writes, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul wisely uses scripture to establish biblical precedents and further get his point across to his audience, right? In the same way that we use scripture to back up our claims, Paul is doing the same thing here. Okay, I said this thing, and you may not believe me, but here's the scripture to back it up. He references Exodus 20. I'm sure most of us are familiar with that, right? The Ten Commandments. 
but he only lists out some of the commandments. And if you look closely at verse 9, you'll notice that Paul lists out only those that pertain to how people are to treat each other, right? You know, if you're a Bible student, you know that the, maybe like the first half of the, of the Ten Commandments are all towards God, and the second half, the latter half, are all towards other people. As a Pharisee and scholar of the law, Paul also quotes Leviticus 19 the same way that Jesus did by summarizing the latter half of the Ten Commandments into one singular command. Love one another as you love yourself. Paul's point, Paul's point in in writing this is to remind the church that our relationship with one another, you know, that horizontal relationship, right? That vertical relationship matters. Of course it does. Right? That's, in, in Jesus talking about the greatest commandment, he speaks on that first, right? Love the Lord your God, right? Vertical. But then he says that the second is also the same. You are to love one another as you love yourself. Horizontal relationship. It matters. So let's ask ourselves this. What does it look like for us, the church, right? Big C, Big C church, the church, to love one another. And what are some of the hindrances that get in the way of that? Right, we, we talked about money earlier. Could be money. Gossip. Slander. Not preferring each other. It's important for us to remember that for those of us who are in Christ... We're called to love in a way that's different from the world, right? Set apart, right? That's what we're called to be. Set apart, sanctified, holy. We're called to love in a way that's different from the world. We do relationships differently, right? We do relationships differently. We do things to and for each other that bless simply because we can. Do you understand how opposite that is of how the world operates? How countercultural that is to this day and age. You know, I'm just, I just want to bless you, brother and sister. Um, if I can be honest, I re- I, before I came up here, I received an envelope. You know, those things where you just kind of like you're, you're, you're going about your, your pastoral duties and you kind of feel an envelope in your hand and you're like, oh, thank you, praise the Lord. And it, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, it doesn't get old for me. And I hope it doesn't because I don't feel worthy to be given anything like that. Uh, But I think that's a perfect example of how we are to love each other. I just want to bless you. I don't want anything in return, right? Uh, I don't have to list out a bunch of conditions for you to meet in order for you to receive my love. I just want to give it freely. The world's version of love is transactional. Right? And in, in, in some sense, all kinds of love is transactional, but really, the world's version of love is transactional by nature. Right? Uh, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of thing. The love that Paul talks about here is not transactional, but unconditional. You know, I'll scratch your back, no strings attached. Right? And that way, everybody's back is scratched. Right? It feels good. Our motivation in our love for one another is different. In the same way that we do relationships different, our motivation is also different, or at least it should be, right? Which makes searching our hearts, you know, looking at that proverbial mirror, all the more difficult and challenging. Why? Because we're faced with our own failures, our own lack of love, our own guilt and shame and hurt. You know, there are very real and valid stories in this room right now of betrayal and disloyalty, of abuse and mistreatment. There's unbearable pain in this room and and deep, sorrowful anguish. Right, you know, there's that thing, you know, when we, when, we, when we say to ourselves, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to love because I'm scared I'll get hurt again. 
or you know that gets switched up sometimes and we say you know I'm I don't really deserve of anyone's I'm not deserving of anyone's love I'm too broken I'm too far gone if that's you this morning uh, please hear this God's grace is sufficient God's grace is sufficient his is a love that hopes all things right as the word tells us his is a love that abides his is a love that heals wounds his is a love that enables us to do things that we are powerless to do without him his is a love that moves us to love the way he does and also receive love in return that's what we have in christ that's what we have as believers, and that's why uh, the, the, the scriptures say, stir one another in love, right? Because, you know, I think of food a lot, and, you know, when I think of stir, I think of peanut butter. And so, you know, when, when, you, when you get that peanut butter jar, and it's, you know, not the skippy, but like the real type, you know, the oil on top type of thing, and you have to stir it, right, to get it nice and mixed up. That's what I see when it comes to, to us stirring love for each other. You know, we don't want to be that gross, hard <laughs> peanut butter, but we want to be stirred up in love towards each other in order for us to love the way that God does and also to receive love in return. Verse 10, moving forward. Paul writes, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Or some translations say love is the fulfillment of the law. So he says first, love does no wrong to a neighbor. This, this phrase, no wrong, means no evil thing, right? Love does no evil thing to a neighbor. Paul's call to love our neighbor, you know, those in closest proximity to us, is an active one. And this act of love doesn't seek to harm another person, but to bless them instead, right? You know, and we might not think necessarily of physical harm, but, you know, we've thought thoughts before, right? Maybe a little bit of ill will towards another person. To be marked by genuine agape, Jesus-centered love is to actively seek the welfare of our brothers and sisters. Are we doing that? Seeking the welfare of our brothers and sisters. You know, when we, when we look at the commandments Paul lists out in, in verse 9, you know, there's a lot of uh, you shall not, right? You shall not do this, you shall not do that, do not do this, do not do that. And we would do well to follow after these, right? To not do those things. But we're also left to fill in the blank as to what we should do. Right? For example, you shall not commit adultery. Okay? What you should do, if you're married, is to love your spouse and be faithful to them. Because guess what? Your spouse is also your neighbor. You shall not steal. Okay? What you should do is increase your generosity and, and give. You know, so on and so forth. Now, we can list out the things that, that we shouldn't do, but what about the things that we should do? in order to look out for the welfare of our brothers and sisters. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law, Paul says. And Paul here is simply echoing Jesus and his teachings in this part of the text. When Jesus spoke of the greatest commandment in the Gospels, when we talked about this earlier, he said that it is to, he's, it's in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. All encompassing. Jesus says, these two commandments. And this is another radical statement by both Jesus and Paul here. You know, Paul, who is an expert in the law, right? Again, reminder. He's saying that love is what fulfills the law. And this points to Jesus being the only one who meets the requirements of the law. And so, in order for us to do that, we look to him. 
We look to Jesus. It's his perfection, not ours, that fulfills the law. So we look to him. We become little versions of him, right? That's what a Christian means, right? Little Christ. And we become imitators of him, imitators of his grace, imitators of his mercy, imitators of his love. As much as we have been given those things, we are to be imitators of those things, right? Giving them back freely to our brothers and sisters. Be a copycat, right? Be a copycat of Jesus. You know, there's like a negative connotation about being copycat. Like, there's, no, you know, there's no originality. It's kind of lame, right? Come on, like be original. But when it comes to Jesus, I'll, you know, I'll be the biggest copycat of all time. And I hope that you can be too. Imitate Jesus. Be imitators of Jesus. Verse 11. Verse 11, Paul writes, Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So there's this shift, right, in dynamic. We talk, we're talking about loving each other, uh, you know, we're talking about money a little bit, uh, preferring each other and being there for each other, loving ourselves as we, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. But now Paul shifts the, 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 the dynamic of, of the letter into holiness and our witness as Christians. And it still ties into to loving others. And he does this beautifully. He says, besides this, you know the time. You know the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. This word wake here means to wake up, to rise up, to stand up. How we love matters, but even more so because our time is short, right? You know, verses 8 through 10, Paul, you told us, told us to love each other. Sounds good. I'll get to it when I can, right? And Paul says, I'm not even giving you that excuse because the time is short. Paul emphasizes here a sense of urgency, leaving no room for procrastination because time is limited and Jesus is coming back soon. Right? I mean, it doesn't take much nowadays to look, what, to look at what's happening in the world and see the signs of the times. Right? Jesus is coming back soon. And in light of this, Paul is giving a command, a charge to wake up, you know, to shake off the sleepiness and to put to work active love. Put it to work. Now more than ever, because our time is short, our call to love, to, our, call for, our call to love one another is all the more important. And this is a sobering reminder. Right? Of all the things that Paul can talk about, right, in, in, in the way that he's being urgent in this matter, right, he talks about loving each other. You know, he, 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 can, he, can, he can say a bunch of different things in order for us to be, you know, to give us a sense of urgency. You know, be, be, be watchful, be alert, be sober-minded. And all these things are biblical and true. But Paul here is saying, in the same line of urgency, you are to love one another. For salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. And this word salvation here is the imminent return of Jesus. Prophetically, this is correct, right? Because Jesus is coming back. Amen? Amen. Jesus is coming back. The Bible tells us so. But this is also correct in the sense that our salvation really is nearer now than we first believed, right? It's, it's nearer that now than when you first got saved, it's nearer now than when we first started this study or when we were singing worship earlier. It's nearer now. You know, it may, may seem silly to, to think about how time works, right? But, but Paul is, this is what he's talking about. Because it, it seems so obvious. Obviously, this is how time works. I, I'm getting older. But Paul's point here and his reminder to you and me is that every day, every hour, every minute, Every second in the faith is a day, an hour, a minute, a second closer to us being reunited with Jesus. Right? And isn't that the end goal? 
And I find, I don't know about you, but uh, being reunited with Jesus sounds really good right now. Sounds really good. I'm, I'm not talking about this in, in a morbid and dark way, but in a hopeful way, in a, in a heavenly-minded way, as the Bible calls us to do, in a way that should bring comfort to you and to me, and in a way that simply reminds us that this earth is not our home. This world is not our home. Heaven is. Right? We're, we're, we're just passing through. We're sojourners, as, as the scriptures say. Verse 12. Verse 12 says this, Paul writes, The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV, if, if you don't know yet. But in the NASB version of the Bible, it says that the night is almost gone and the day of Christ's return is near. And in the CSB, it says the night is nearly over. Now, verse 12 and verse 14, right, the, the end of our passage, 12 and 14, serve as bookends to verse 13. Right, they kind of a, they do a little sandwich thing. With verse 12, calling believers to put on the armor of light. And if you look at verse 14, it says to put on Christ. Right, put on armor of light put on Christ. And, and throughout Scripture, we see contrasting imagery to explain to us a biblical truth all the time, right? Contrasting imagery such as night and day, right? Uh, darkness and light, evil, good. All these things are, are spread throughout Scripture. And Paul is saying that this current moment we are living is still considered night, because Jesus hasn't come back yet. That's what he's saying here. And I think we can all agree that we live in dark times, right? I think that's an understatement at this point, that we live in dark times, times of war, times of confusion, deceit, anxiety, fear, right? If you look at all the statistics out there available for all of us, you know, you'd want to turn it off because it'd be too much. The point Paul is making here is that Although we are in the night, day is coming soon. And that's what we're looking forward to. The return of Jesus is at hand. Right? Awesome, right? I can't wait for Jesus to return. All right, what do I do now? Right, what, are, what are we to do now while we wait? While we wait in eager anticipation for Jesus to return? You know, sit down and you know, just twiddle our thumbs together? No, Paul says this. He says to... To cast off. Cast off. And this word, and this, this, this phrase cast off simply means to lay aside. And that's what other translations say. To lay aside. And in, in, in the Greek, uh, it, it's kind of intense the way this word is presented. It means to throw off your clothing. It means to take off your clothes and throw it. You know, think of a, a dirty, filthy shirt that you just can't wait to take off so you could get clean. And finally ripping that thing off and getting rid of it. This is the intensity the original text is trying to convey. Get it off of you, Paul says. We are to cast off the darkness and put on the armor of light. And this closely echoes Paul's writings in Ephesians regarding putting on the whole armor of God. You can look into that later. And well, so what is this darkness that Paul is talking about? It's, it's anything that's not of God. It's anything that is not of the Lord. That is what this darkness is. Throw off any and everything that is not of the Lord. Simply speaking, this is a call to holiness. Paul is saying, be holy. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 says this. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, 
Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Later on in, in that letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Peter writes this, Therefore, rid yourselves, put off, cast off, get rid of it. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And just like Paul is writing to believers here, Peter is also writing to believers here, right? When you look at those words like deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, that's unbeliever talk. Those are characteristics that you maybe put on somebody, somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Nope, Peter is talking to the believers. Rid yourselves, Peter says. And Peter could have written down a hundred different acts here. And the message is still the same. We have the natural tendency, you know, because of our sinfulness, to put on these things. To be malicious, to be deceitful, hypocritical, envious, slanderous, and a hundred different things. A hundred more. But Peter implores us as new creations, right? He reminds us so gently as new creations to rid ourselves of these things. And this is where the practical side of our faith is seen. Right? It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to do it. The practical is where our faith is actually tested. As James tells us, faith without works is dead. Our faith isn't meant to be a mere concept, you know, something that we can debate about and you know, have intellectual conversations about. But it is a living reality that is tangible, something that's seen, something that's heard, something that's felt by us and those around us, something that bears fruit, and fruit is observable. And in the same line of thought, and Paul has done it before in, 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 our, in, our, in our study in Romans, you know, he's... he's constantly emphasizing this process of sanctification and growth and maturing by putting off something, right? Putting off this and putting on that, right? Fill in the blank. Turn from this and turn to this instead. Get rid of this and instead receive this. Verse 13. Paul writes, let us walk properly, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. And these are just some of the things that the world says is okay to do, right? If you look at these things, this is what the world says is okay to do. It was, it was true for the culture of the Roman Empire, at the time, and if you know your Roman history, you know that this was considered normal. This was a normal thing for them. And it's made its way into the fabric of our culture today because humans are the same, right? It wasn't by accident that Paul decided, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to use these examples. And again, remember, he's talking to the Roman church, not to unbelievers who didn't know any better but to Christians who do know better. And he's writing this for you and me today. If you look at these things, you know, it can be a real bummer, right? You look at these, these, these words, these, uh, these traits. Isn't this what kills our Christian witness? Isn't this what kills the church and the witness of the church? And so Paul tells us to, to be sober-minded, in these things, to put these off, because he knows, he knows that these are the things that, that ensnare and trap us. Put off these things and put on the armor of light instead. And lastly, in verse 14, Paul says this, but put on 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I'm going to read that again. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Can everybody say that this morning? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is Paul's final edification in this 13th chapter. You know, like we've, we've said, and Pastor Andy has touched on it too, that there weren't any real chapter breaks or verses in the original letters, just one long scroll, right? That's why they, so Paul puts his name in the, in the beginning because when you open up the scroll, like, who's it from? Oh, Paul. Okay, cool, sounds good. I'm going to read the rest of it. So this is Paul's final edification in this chapter. And this echoes a lot of his writing to different churches in those times. So let's look at some of them. To the church in Galatia, Paul writes this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. For those of you who, have been, who were baptized into Christ have now been clothed with Christ. To the church in Ephesus, Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, chapter 21, chapter, Ephesians 4, verses 21 through 24. He writes, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. There's that word, put on. Put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. And last but not least, to the church in Corinth, Paul writes this, 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. It was important for Paul to be reminded of these things, for other Christians and believers to be reminded of these things, that you are Christ's. You are not your own anymore. And so therefore, put on Christ. Get rid of your old self and put on Christ instead. If it's important for Paul and the church back then, it's important for us here too. Paul reminds us that this is a work that only happens if, if we put on Christ. Once we put him on, we are able to starve the flesh and not giving it what it wants, right? I think a lot of times we may have a misunderstanding of what the flesh is like. You know, I'm going to starve the flesh. I'm not going to watch this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to read this. I'm going to uh, isolate myself from these worldly things, right? So I can be protected from the temptations of the enemy. That's not how that works. We remember that this isn't a try harder, do better text. The text isn't telling us to, to try harder, to be better. You just got to do more. This isn't a, a, a sin less and you'll be good with God text either. You know, just the less I sin, you know, the less I expose myself to worldly things, I'm good with God. Let's just get, out, get, get that out of the way. This is not that text. This is a text that tells us that we need to be renewed. Renewed. If you want to write that down, please do so. We need to be renewed. We need the renewal that comes from Jesus. And that is a work that only he can do in and through us. We need to be renewed in our love for each other as we talked about earlier, renewed in our love for each other, and we need to be renewed in our walk as Christians, in our witness, in our holiness. And this is a daily thing. This isn't a one-time mountaintop experience and you're good for the rest of your life, right? This is a daily battle, a daily dying 
to ourselves, a daily uh, uh, change of affections. Lord, change my affections. Lord, transform my love. Instead of me loving myself, I want to love others. I want to love you every day, and it's a battle. That's why the Lord tells us to put on the armor. So uh, two very simple points this morning. Two very simple points, and the first is this. We are called to love one another. We are called to love one another. If you want to break down our our passage this morning, verses 8 through 10 teaches us to do that. We are called to love one another. And the second is this. We are called to put on Christ. And that's what verses 11 through 14 is about. We're called to love one another, and we are called to put on Christ. And, you know, it, it, it seems very simple, right? When we look at the text, you know, there's a lot of words, you know, especially in Romans. It's very heady. You know, we've talked about this before. But really, the, the truth of it all is very simple. You know, we, we, the Bible's call in our lives as Christians is very simple. There's, there's no 12-step, 7-step plan. It's very simple. And in this passage, it calls us to love one another and to put on Christ. Now, doing that, that's where the hard part is, right? That's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So we've received this word today. We received this word today, and it's good. It's challenging. I'm very challenged in, in studying for this, this, this message, and even now as we are going through it together, very challenging. And it may cause uh, some of us to, to sacrifice certain things in our lives that we don't necessarily want to sacrifice, right? And, you know, a lot of these things can just come to our mind right now as I say these words. A lot of things that we don't want to sacrifice, a, a lot of things that, you know, the call to die to ourselves you know, which isn't the most comfortable thing. But we see that the reward, the reward, the outcome is glorious. The effect of our Christian call, if we choose to receive it, and that's the kicker, right? There's a call. You know, it goes out. You hear it. But will you receive it? Will you do it? The effect of our Christian call, if we choose to receive it, if we choose to trust God in it and obey it, it can't be compared to anything that this world has to offer because it's simply otherworldly. It's from God. It's from the Lord. And so as much as these things are challenging, be encouraged. Be encouraged that the Lord promises us that we are not alone in this fight. That he has given us a helper in the Holy Spirit. That he has given us his word to guide and to lead as a light unto our path. He has given us the gift of himself. That for those who are in Christ, there is free access to him. That there is no hindrance. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to sign a bunch of papers, right? A bunch of like release forms. No, no. It's just Jesus, and he's calling each and every one of us here right now to come to him, to love each other the way that he loves us, to put on him because he is for us. And so my challenge to to you all this morning is this, and it's it's not impossible. The first one is this, pray for a bigger love for our brothers and sisters. Pray for a bigger love for our brothers and sisters, right? The brethren, the church, other believers. And the second one is this, pray for a deeper affection for the things of the Lord. The the more you you ask the Lord to to change your affections, that you, that, that you, you turn your affections towards him, all the other loves will simply fade away. Pray for a bigger love and pray for a deeper affection. 
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your call on our lives as believers. Well, first and foremost, Lord, thank you that we can call ourselves believers. And it's only because of your son, Jesus Christ, that that is possible. It is only because of your, of your sacrifice, Lord, that any of this is possible. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we are called your beloved. We thank you that we are called your children. We thank you that we are co-heirs with Christ, as your word says, that we have an inheritance in heaven and a hope that does not fail because we are in you. And Lord, we, we thank you for this calling on our lives. As, as challenging as it may seem, Lord, I, I, I thank you that it is not impossible. Thank you, Lord, that it is you who enables us to do these things. It's you who anoints us to do these things, Lord. It's you who, who empowers and strengthens us to do these things. Because, Lord, we know that nothing is impossible with you. And so, Lord, we do pray for a bigger love. Lord, I pray that you would expand our love, not just to ourselves, not just to those who, who we're close with, Lord, but those who, who we may not have a relationship with, but... They're our brother and sister nonetheless. Increase our love, Lord. And we also pray, Lord, that you would deepen our affection for the things that you have called us to do. Deepen our affection for you, Lord Jesus. Remind us, Lord, that it isn't a matter of not doing things, but it's always a matter of just running back to you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that we are able to run back to you, God. As, as prodigal sons and daughters coming back to the house of our Father, Lord, we thank you that it's you who runs after us. It's you who meets us before we even step foot in the door. Thank you, Lord. Do a work in us, Lord, that only you can do. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Fill us with your love, Lord, that we may be able to give it back to you and to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will hold